we have just wrapped up our third day on snow here at the Blister Summit. Um, skied somewhere in the vicinity of 7 to 12 inches of fresh today. Uh, you're welcome. It's very considerate of us that we just keep bringing fresh snow in for you for the Blister Summit because we are great hosts. Uh, so um, I had a heck of a fun day um, skiing with a whole bunch of different people. I hope you all did as well. Um, both get on some interesting new product and get to go ski with some interesting people. Um, I sure did, and uh, that was a really, really good day out there. So uh, now time for another panel session, this one on ski boot design. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this panel because you may have heard uh, recently there are some new innovations in the boot world that have made quite a splash, but these aren't the only things happening in the boot world. And so I think what we're gonna do tonight is talk uh, with each of the individuals from, we have several different brands up here, they will be introducing themselves, talk a bit about some of the new things that they are doing uh, as brands, and then just open this up to a free for all and hopefully somebody ends up throwing haymakers at some point. So. Um, to that end, Tom Petrowski, tell us a little bit about yourself, your position, and what's going on with K2 ski boots at the moment. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Tom Petrowski, I'm the global product line manager for ski boots at K2. Um, been in position in America now about three years. And yeah, we've got BOA, which I'm sure all you guys have seen outside there. Most of you had a little click on it. Nobody seems to be able to walk past without clicking it. Um, it's the big thing for us this year. Uh, we have all the other boots are still there, but BOA, we are really excited for. We genuinely believe it's a step forward in how the boot fits, what we can do with the boot. So we're really excited for what we can do in the future with it. Tell us a little bit about this new BOA system. What kind of boots are these on? <clears throat> yeah. So from us, uh, we have it on our Recon and Anthem, which is our fixed cuff or mountain boot. Uh, we have it from a 130 flex down to 110 for men, 115 down to 95 for women. But we also have it on our free ride boots, which is 50-50 boot, resort boot, bit of a touring boot, the war mode on the back. So I really push for us to have it in both categories. As I alluded to, I really do believe BOA adds something good to a ski boot in terms of the fit. So I wanted to offer it in our two kind of biggest lines. So yeah, fixed cuff and free ride for us. Okay, Christoph. Uh, my name is Christoph, I'm from Fisher. I'm the global product manager for Alpine Ski Boots. I'm based in upper Austria um, and spend a lot of time in Montebelluna, Italy where we do the development. Um, for the coming season 23, 24 for Fisher, I'd say the big story is performance. Um, just really across the board, bringing performance boots um, in an area where we've kind of lacked. Uh, in a part of that, we also have BOA. Um, and for us, BOA was uh, in line with this performance goal to bring boots that ski well, ski better as past Fisher boots, um, ski better as than the, the bench line on the market um, to help everybody get better at skiing, to help good skiers have an even better day out there. Um, so BOA was one technology aspect that we brought in to bring more performance. Um, and the second thing was uh, collaboration with ZipFit, um, also in the interest of performance. So I think to keep the answer short, uh, Fisher is bringing high performance boots this year. And just say a bit about the model, a bit more about the model, low volume, mid volume, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where we have the BOA featured is a mid volume boot. Uh, we have the ZipFit featured in a low volume and a mid volume BOA boot, um, but even the HV high volume boots that we rebranded, updated this year, um, had some changes made with an emphasis on more performance. Okay. Hello everybody, I'm Riccardo Bonaiti. I come from Italy. I work as product line manager in Dalbello. Dalbello is situated next to Montebelluna in Asolo, a few minutes away. And uh, we have a pretty wide collection, but the bigger news from this year are a new line of a free piece boot called Cabrio that is substantially substituting the former Krypton and Lupo, a uh, Krypton and Chakra, and Cabrio Free that is substituting the former Lupo. 
These are the biggest news from this year and also quantum free. Can you tell us a bit about the differences then? Yes. Uh, Cabrio, about Cabrio, yep. Cabrio free or, or quantum? Go both. <laughs> okay. So substantially, Cabrio is a pure free ride line uh, and is developed for performance in downhill. It's a low volume line, so 99 millimeter last. Uh, Cabrio free is based on the same platform, is 99 millimeter last, but has the cap capability of walking. We have DynaFit inserts and ski walk mechanism. Then uh, Quantum Free instead is a different concept of touring. We are on 1.3 kilogram ski boot, so main focus on the uphill. And here we have the news is on the liner. We have developed the new liner towards sustainability with sustainable materials. Great. Ross. Ross. Yeah, uh, Ross Her. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing for the Oberop North America group. Uh, Oberop North America is the owning group of DinaFit. Uh, and yeah, we're most talking about the Tigard boot collection here at this event. It's a boot that we just launched just last week. It's a four buckle kind of Alpine hybrid freeride boot. Uh, for us, it's sort of a, a throwback to Franz Klammer era of DinaFit ski boots, uh, where performance downhill skiing was the inspiration. And then, you know, for sure we're a touring brand. So we're trying to, to balance that heritage of downhill performance and our touring knowledge that we've kind of built out today. We're, you know, really, really proud of our, the mechanism that connects the cuff and the shell came from, you know, the passion of a certain individual that, you know, is pretty obsessed with nuanced ways to make your day really, really good in the backcountry, make your transitions a little easier. And then, you know, like kind of finding that balance of downhill ski performance that still rock walks really well and is compatible with all the different bindings today. Hey, what's up? Nice. What's up? <laughs> what's up, bro? Um, Round three? Yeah, I don't, I don't how, do you, how do you follow this up? You like snuck onto this panel. So yeah. what, how would you talk, what do you, what, what should you say right now? <clears throat> um, Hoji, I'm just like everyone else, put one boot on at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then rarely take them off yeah um okay uh one thing you may have noticed uh that uh among the speakers here is there was a lot of talk about high performance there was zero talk about weight savings um yeah um so you said it was hoji yeah yeah um <laughs> Let's talk about this a little bit because, um, you know, in pretty recent history in the ski boot world, we were not hearing so much about high performance. We were hearing more about, look at how light we just made everything. And yes, of course, there are compromises and trade-offs here. Sometimes lightweight things can be absolutely the right tool for the job. Hoji, where are you at personally these days in terms of that push for performance, but also an interest in saving weight on your gear and specifically ski boots? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, we kind of had a, where we've witnessed like a bit of a backlash, uh, especially in these, this kind of hybrid category of downhill performance driven ski boots that you can go ski touring in. And, and there was a bit of a push for oh, the lightest one, the lightest one, the lightest one for the, the previous years here. And the easy, uh, one of the, the ways to really save weight is obviously the liner, the shells are the shells, there's different materials, wall thickness and such. But if you want to achieve like a, a decent amount of downhill performance, you have to build a structure and you can't, you can't reduce that down to, you, you can only do it, take it so far, but the liner can be, you can save hundreds of grams on and on and on. But like suddenly I think we had a lot of products that the shell was one thing and the liner was not really fitting into that shell for what it was intended to. And it was just trying to reach this fantasy number 
okay, that's nice, but like, I think I think the trend like was too far in the direction of like the lightest possible best skiing boot, and what we're seeing now is the the weight isn't as important, and it's more about having a a liner that per, that also matches the performance of the shell. Mm-hmm. I'd like to ask you for how much of this was driven by consumer feedback versus just within your respective companies, uh, the thought of, you know, internally thinking, hey, we may have, we kind of went to see how far we could go. We maybe need to come back from the edge. Ross? Yeah. Um, I think for us, our boot program, I'd put a lot of weight behind like the company culture that we have right now. I mean, the way we work together, like you could consider me a little more corporate than Hoji probably, you know? You don't say. Yeah, (laughs) right? (laughs) Uh, So um, I'm, you know, my role, I'm like a sales guy. I shouldn't be on this panel, right? I'm not here to sell anyone anything, but our culture and our group has sort of supported the right people, the right ideas, the conduit to feedback and how you can get that feedback to the right people in the team that are gonna build the products for us. And so I think we've kind of built, call it coalition within our team. Um, You know, so it's like Fritz, Hoji and I sort of sitting together, hearing feedback coming to events like this, knowing kind of what is the problem that we need to solve? How do we really address that? What are we hearing the most? Um, You know, like what does Hoji want to want himself? Like, what does Fritz know from his time? And then like, you know, for me, I have the the pipeline of, of sales numbers. Sure, like, you know, at the end of the day, consumers make decisions with their dollars and how they buy things, but are they always perfectly happy with that decision? Can we do better? Like, what are we really hearing? And, and so the three of us together have kind of built this coalition. We spend a lot of time in Europe, you know, we spend a lot of time kind of conveying that message to our team so that everyone comes on board with like, what are we really trying to accomplish? What are we tr- really trying to solve? And what are we hearing? And trying to be as maybe humble about that because it's not always what you want to hear. Um, yeah, and I guess on the subject of, of weight, yeah, for sure. Like, I don't know if this is the heaviest boot we've ever come out with. I don't think it is, um, but it's certainly a category for us as a touring brand that's for sure spent a lot of time building things super lightweight. We build a lot of lightweight product. It was clear that in this category to to be relevant, to do something unique, like weight wasn't the first problem we needed to solve here. We needed to solve something that was, you know, for comfort, for sure. Um, But ski performance, like if you're out there today, it was good snow. If you're wasting any time, Mm -hmm. like you're wasting time on a powder day is the worst feeling ever. Right. And so, you know, having a simple mechanism that you can count on that works really well, that you can, you know, do your transition. Cause even on the resort, you're still doing transitions, right? Like you're hopping on the T-bar, you're hopping on the chairlift, you're going in and out, like, you know, transitions matter, even if you're not a schemo racer. So keeping all that simple and clean and, and listening to what people need. Yeah, I'd say like the culture that we've built, I think has been pretty good to address that. Hmm. Ricardo? Oh, then it's my turn. Well, uh, as Del Bello, actually, we are pretty new in the classic lightweight touring world. Yeah. We stepped inside just four, four years ago, four seasons ago with the Quantum line. And uh, let's say that we have targeted a completely different consumer because as Del Bello, we used to have Lupo line that was capable of going uphill, but we are talking about a 1.8 kilogram boot. So we are talking about performance on the downhill. So for us, this was a first step in this category. And actually we have been, let's say, pretty successful. We can say it and as a first try in that category. And uh, let's say that when we talk about this development, uh, we have worked with some Alpine guides with feedback from the market. We obviously looked a lot to our competitors because we have, they were already doing it. So you learn from the best. And that's how Quantum was born. Now that there is also Cabrio that is substituting the previous Lupo line, Cabrio 3. And here we are, uh, we have targeted a lower weight, but uh, we have, haven't gone to 1.4 kilograms or 1.5 because at the end, when you are talking about this kind of athletes and user, they are still looking for a certain type of stability. So 
if you want that performance, you can't go too low with the weight of the boot. Mm -hmm. So we are lighter, but not that lighter. Kristoff, mm -hmm. what's the conversation like at Fisher on these things? And I, I mean, Fisher's not the only brand, but with a strong history in cross country in particular, I was curious how much that might push you know, the manufacturing of ski boots toward that lighter end of the spectrum, just given the heritage of the company. Yeah, um, I mean, for Fisher, the mission statement of the entire company, including Alpine and Nordic Division, is to be the athlete's number one choice. And depending on how you define athlete there, that could be an intermediate beginner skier, that could be a World Cup racer, and that spans both disciplines. Um, I think the original question, which had to do about weight, was kind of about how do we decide if weight is important or not. For us, it's uh, a question keeping in mind that we want to be the athlete's number one choice or we want to develop, develop those kind of products, um, is to decide what, is, what are we talking about. Um, the right tool for the right job. We have two successful touring boots in our collection, the Traverse and the Transalp. Um, one under a thousand grams and one right around 1300 grams. Um, for both of those developments, weight was critical. Um, for what we're presenting now and where we really have our focus on now, RC4, performance, pieced, weight was not in the discussion because that was, was not necessary for what that product needed to do. Um, we listened to the consumers and yeah, we've also more than listening, basically tested and realized that in a performance product, saving weight is not helping us get there. Um, as a final point on weight, uh, for me, it's very easy for an end consumer, for a dealer, for a buyer to compare weights. They're listed in the catalog. Every one of us makes boots with a weight listed and you can just compare, but it misses some of the the essence of the product. Um, 100 grams sounds like a lot, but for example, what does a roll of toilet paper weigh? For the record, it's about 120 to 130 grams. Hmm. If I told you put this roll of toilet paper in your backpack and you're gonna ski better, you'd probably do it. You wouldn't think twice about that extra weight, but when you see it listed on the, on the sheets or on the websites, or even in the blister reviews, Oh my God, that's a hundred grams more, but like yeah, performance, it doesn't need weight in certain categories. More of this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tom, how is K2 thinking about weight these days and how much of that is informed by specifically consumer feedback? Yeah, consumer feedback's an interesting one because <clears throat> nobody's telling us to make heavier boots, really. You are, but okay. you're obviously a very different consumer than okay. most actual skiers. And you're also in a very different product. You're riding a Redster CS. Now I would argue, yeah, when you're in that super high level boot, then weight really isn't a consideration. Now for the everyday, maybe five days a year yeah. skier, yep. they actually do want a lightweight boot. It does make a difference on the bench. But we, every boot we've made for 23 <laughs> compared to 22 has got heavier. We were at the bottom in terms of weight. I think reading your reviews, our recons are basically down there anyway. Yeah. So we've had room to play with. We as well want to make a better performing boot and ways to do that is often to add weight. It's usually not to pull weight out of it. So everything we've done is actually adding weight to things, but we are cognizant of it. We don't want to take like a 1650 gram boot and make it over two kilograms because it's going to vastly affect yeah. it. Yeah. And like our BFC is a really good example. We had the original BFC and it fit really well. The fit was good, but it was quite a heavy boot. We updated it a couple of years back, kept the fit identical, but we saved around 20% weight and it's doubled the sales. So weight does matter to the average consumer but it doesn't matter to some consumers, yourself included. But for the average, weight is still a factor, but it's not, we're not trying to pull every gram out of it. I think most brands, we were racing to the bottom, we reached that bottom and now we're coming back up and we're, we're in a happy medium of that kind of 1800 gram. Okay. Right. Um, I think we should talk about BOA some more. Um, 
We did uh, a thing we call Blister Happy Hour. It's a live stream thing that Blister members can jump in on. And honestly, I, I, I have said, I think that was probably gonna be one of the most important boot conversations that like happens this year. Um, and uh, so Blister members, go. you can find that on the Blister member clubhouse and you can uh, check out a video of that conversation we had. Um, Here's my question. Um, I want to go to Dina Fit and Dal Bello on this. Um, there's been so much talk about BOA. You, Ross, and Ricardo have had a chance to check this out. Is there a philosophical opposition to moving to a, this new BOA system that does add weight to a boot? And I would like to see if anybody wants to you know, do a sort of defense of the traditional buckle. Ross? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd go back to our idea of like coalition within our team. You know, you know, I say myself, Fritz, Hoji, we're called the voice of North America within our team, you know, and then we have some really strong colleagues in Austria and Italy and all over the world. And, um, you know, our like colleagues in Scandinavia, you know, maybe agree with us a little bit more than the Italian team. And, you know, that that argument, that ability to converse about like what we want for our consumer, right, is, is really, really productive. What we're not hearing from our athlete team, which is, is a huge piece of our company, um, you know, like how we support our athletes and what they want to pursue and what we want to do. We're not hearing, hey, I really wish we had a boa on our ski boot. I, like we're, we're not hearing that, you know, we're wanting something really reliable, something really simple, something, you know, that solves a problem that I'm experiencing, right? now, you know, and we hear that, like we evolve through problems, right? Most of my email, most of my text messages from our athletes and from our team, it's not just high fives and how great everything is every day, right? It's like, hey, I broke this thing and my day wasn't so good because of it. Hey, I was out doing this other thing and this thing didn't work. And like, those are the problems we're really trying to solve and trying to find a simple way that we can deliver to that feedback and, you know, like if, if we're not listening to that, to the point of consumer feedback and all that, like then we won't be relevant and we won't have super long standing relationships with our athletes if we don't. So on the topic of BOA, we, we do use like a ratchet dial system on some of our boots. Yeah. Um, we're using it in a very, very different way, though. Like our, our ratchet dial doesn't ask like we're, we're not asking the ratchet dial to deform the shell of our ski boot. We're, we're using this ratchet dial to move componentry onto your foot and hold you in a secure way, in a different way, with a different dial, you know, and it's a, it's just a, it's just a different program, you know, and, and we think we're solving just for a different problem than, than shell management and shell volume management. Um, Cause that's a, that's a big ask to ask something to like take this piece of plastic and wrap it around your foot and hold everything super securely. So we try and like ask a little less of our system to, to solve just one problem at a time. Ricardo? <laughs> well, in Dalbello right now, we are don't love or hate the BOA as them. Uh, we, we already had it in the collection, not a BOA, but a, a rotor mechanism on the quantum line, but it was on Turing and we are talking about a 900 grams qubit. Uh, right now, uh, on the market, uh, we, ha we have actually the same uh, feedback from our athletes. So they look at it, but they are not maybe super enthusiast. Maybe they are a little bit diffident because they don't know them. They have their concernings uh, on how it works and how it closer close around the foot. I have to say that I have the occasion to ski on the K2 on the, um, and on the Salomon ski boot with the BOA. And for sure, uh, it wraps in properly the foot. It is a good sensation, but uh, um, and we see a, an opportunity probably in some segment of the market, some kind of consumer that may likes it. But there's also true that are, there are also a part of the market that may not likes it uh, because you don't have the the possibility to completely change to, to, to adjust the for, the forefoot closure and the instep closure differently. So. Let's say that for sure it's interesting. Uh, it looks like it's working well, but uh, I think that uh, it's at the moment it lays in a part of the market 
we will have to see. Probably the market will tell us mm -hmm. if everybody wants it or if it's a yes or a no. Mm -hmm. This is what how we are looking at it right now. Yeah. Um, care to respond, uh, people with you know boa ski boots, Kristoff? Um, boa works. <laughs> it has a function. It's not a gimmick. Uh, the system that the colleagues at Boa have developed and been working on for the last five years uh, meets the requirements that many of us brands had set for them as years ago they started um, developing this. We were not inclined to adopt it. It costs more than a set of buckles for us. Um, it looks different. We knew it would polarize, um, and we, we did not commit to it right away. We tested for over a year on old boots, um, even built a prototype mold to start trying to integrate this. Um, and the feedback just keeps coming positive that it works. Um, concerns about durability are laid to rest um, and that it, it improves the boot um, and coming back to kind of the Fisher view on it, performance, it increased the performance of the boot. So we didn't want to, but our, it, it worked, <laughs> it works <laughs> and it, it makes the boot better. Hmm. Anything yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if we're gonna put out something new it's going to be better than what was there before. And we genuinely believe Boa offers that. Um, a lot of you guys have skied it this time. None of you have really come back and said you don't like the system. It does work. Um, it wraps the foot in a new way. It's much more comfortable. I've had people here who've had loads of work done to their boots. They've tried ours on out of the box and it feels as good. So there's something the Boa offers that a buckle boot can't. It, does work, it makes our boots better. As cross off said, it's more expensive, it's heavier. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why it wouldn't be better, but it is, the grand scheme of things, it is just better than buckles. Um, so we're confident that moving forward with it, we're offering a better product than we could offer if we kept with buckles, basically. Hmm. But Christoph and Tom, you would agree the market will dictate and decide. Yeah. You're comfortable on that. Yes, I mean, yeah. completely. Okay. I mean, I think up to that point, we when we started the development on the new RC4 MV boots, um, I think we were the only brand. Solomon did it differently. K2 did it differently. We actually invested up front into the new concept and in a way and the tooling to make it with BOA and to make it with buckles. And I can tell you, if we had to make that decision today, we wouldn't have invested in the buckle boot. A year and a half ago, we weren't as confident that it would receive, would be received as well. And yeah, we have grown to accept it even more. Yeah, yeah we didn't develop a buckle version of it. We did just go with BOA. But even in our forecasting early on, we got it completely wrong. Because we were like, this is a new technology. We, we did believe in it, but we, believe the retailers and consumers may be slower to adopt. So when we did our initial forecast, we were still very much, buckles are still gonna be by far the biggest one and Boa's just gonna supplement it. That's not the case. When we've got done the selling, it's completely the opposite. We're barely selling any buckle boots anymore. It's Boa. Let's talk walk modes. Um, walk modes are not like in this year. That's not the sexy conversation at the moment. Um, where in past years, it absolutely has been the conversation. Um, Hoji, you spending any more time thinking about walk modes or are you kind of over that? Uh, he got, he got actually mad at me for that question. Did you see the, like, he like <laughs> scoffed. <laughs> no, I just woke up. And okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in a way everyone's kind of, trying to get somewhere with, with walking and skiing performance, compromise, blend, optimization. And uh, I spent a lot of energy in the last couple of years just trying to optimize the, the system that I've been involved with. And that's, that's coming down, that's, that's, that's a few years from now, I guess, uh, probably. But uh, I think I think there's there's still a lot of room to improve, and I mean 
the 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 things that we see right now they're, they're working pretty all right um everyone's got got their own take on it but the principles are are pretty like the basic design is is almost the same mm -hmm. um and there's still a lot of issues with durability that's like the biggest thing that i've learned like dealing with uh one of the things that's that i i try to do is wherever i go wherever i'm skiing whatever opportunity through these kind of you know traveling opportunities is to like talk to to the the shops the managers mm -hmm. the 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 people who are really dealing with the customer and uh what's coming back what do they have to fix and that that's a big part of it like a if you can make something that's not breaking i mean a lot of the people i know uh at a high level of downhill focus skiing they're just deleting lock modes because they're sick of <laughs> things breaking so I, I think ultimately in the end like the focus should be on creating something that doesn't break hmm. and uh we still have some work to do quick sort of show of hands on that as all of you are dealing with and thinking about walk modes. Do you agree with Hoji that the single biggest issue with walk modes right now is durability? Is No. No. I don't, but... Me too. Ricardo, where are you at? No, me too. I feel I don't agree too much. That okay. The main problem is durability. Tom? I don't know. The durability is a big factor, certainly. Um, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you might agree with Hoji. I somewhat okay. agree with Hoji. We like fights I, mean, I, I ski around with a bag of screws and a bunch of tools, and I'm on my hands and knees on top of mountains fixing boots all the time. So that's, totally that's kind of <laughs> – I, I already fixed a couple here, and, like, it's going to continue. So huh. that's, that's – it's, it's the reality that I see. Like, it's not – I'm not going to candy coat it. It's just yeah. how it is. Like, if you're actually out there in the mountains, things are breaking all the time. Okay, so Ricardo or Christoph. What what do you, what are you currently identifying at Dalbello or Fisher in terms of the? Um, I, for me, I think durability is is impacted by having a walk mode. But it is a piece that can fail. There's more bits that can fail. But I think the biggest downside <laughs> for me is the lack of performance. The fact that as soon as you build that into a boot, um, you're making a compromise compared to a standard two buckle or four buckle overlap or overlap, let's say, no more four buckles, <laughs> where you have a rivet, um, screws, two pieces of plastic, where you're really like that standard um, flex point and what makes a overlap boot an overlap boot. As soon as you put a walk mode in that area and allow the boot to open to the back, you've compromised the integrity, the stiffness, the tolerance in that entire cuff. And that for me is the biggest downside, which is where I agree with Hoji in terms of people who are really performance oriented. And I think in this room, we talked to a lot of those that consider deleting the walk mode. It is a compromise. And if your goal is to go far, to go high, to go um, flat, <laughs> traverse, and you really need that long stride. There are great, lightweight, really walkable boots, but performance-wise, there's, it's not, it's a compromise. I agree with Christoph. I mean, for sure, durability is very, very important because when you add a piece to something, you add something that can break. But the main downside is on the performance because in the moment in which you want something to walk, you're changing the interface between the cuff and the shell because if you don't change it, it's not working. And in the moment in which you are changing it, you are creating more space, you are changing it, and so the connection is different, and usually you lose a little bit of power and a little bit of power transmission, yes. Mm -hmm. So totally agree with what you have just said. Ross? Yeah, I guess I, I like, if that was, if this idea of this monster sacrifice we were all making because our boots can walk, we'd all be riding single speed rigid bikes in the mountains every day because we'd be unwilling to trust suspension and derailers and all these other pieces of componentry that make our day significantly better. You know, like 
yeah, you could blow your derailleur off your mountain bike if you take a wrong turn and you don't take care of it or whatever that is. But I think I would guess the vast majority of this room has derailleurs on their mountain bike and they're, they're up for that performance that they get from it and that experience that they get from it, you know? And I think, I, I guess I don't think, I, I think there's a great opportunity to improve in that space. And I, I think that's like, that's been our focus is that experience, you know, like Dean, if it's a touring brand, you know, that has Alpine experience. And today we're, we trust in what we built so much <clears throat> that we want to push it back into, you know, a bigger space than where we've been in the past, you know, because in the past you, we, we felt like we developed this really cool thing that only solved this problem for the ski touring person that wanted the most efficient day you know, and, and I think probably the derailleur was invented for that person that wanted to go faster, you know, on, you know, their road bike probably. And then they found out that has this huge benefit to the mountain biker too. And I think walk mechanisms have a huge benefit to Alpine skiers, you know, for comfort and all sorts of other reasons. And I think, I think to like, just say that walk mechanisms just delete them because I'm not into investing more money and trying to figure it out and how to solve this problem. I think that's unfair to the experience of ski touring and skiing in general, you know, I mean, like I'm a skier before I was a ski tour. And, and I think that obsession with, you know, finding that balance, finding like a thing that skis super good comes out in that. I mean, but I mean, like our, like our mechanism is not perfect. Right. And I think that's what Hoji was speaking to. Like you solve one problem and you find two more, like that's mm -hmm. life. But we're trying to make it better each season, you know, and, and we come here because, mm -hmm. We think that, hey, yeah, with the first time you hop into our boot, we're gonna have to show you, hey, how does this, the Hoji lock work? You know, like you gotta buckle your boot in a different order and you gotta learn a couple different things. But hey, when you hop on your mountain bike, you gotta be in the right gear when you get to that hill. And if you just grab five gears before the transition of your next, you know, from down to up, you're gonna jam it up and it might break. So I think the consumer is up to learn to have a better day. Yeah, I mean, I would I would never delete my walk modes. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm just saying that that shows some of the some of the problems out there. And like, I mean, I dedicated uh, eight years of my life to trying to achieve a way to improve the situation. And um, you know, the what we have today is is quite reliable, and it's working in a much different way than the traditional one. And the, the motivation of, from the beginning of my journey with working on the walk mechanism was because I didn't like what the, the standard was. Mm. And I wanted to achieve something that provided a, my focus was skiing performance. Mm. And I think we've, we've done the work and the, we've done a good job and like, it's not perfect of course, but like it is working in a different way than what the standard walk mechanism is and trying to remove the problems of the flex issues, the play and the breakages because you're holding something in a, in a awkward geometry that amplifies force in a bad way. And it's not to say that it's the best ever, but uh, that's been like my main motivation from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't coming from ski touring. I just wanted, to be able to stand up straight and not freeze my feet at the very, very beginning, because it, that my job was to be in the mountains for 10 to 12 hours a day and ski for about 35 seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> Fair. So the other day we had what I thought was an extremely interesting panel session uh, talking about bindings. Um, and we were talking about specifically um, tech toes, pin bindings, this interface, tiny little tolerances that need to be tiny. Uh, we've got a bunch of boot product managers up here. I would be very interested to hear your thoughts, whether you think that Lars and Hoji and Garai were overstating the problem there with the interface uh, with tech bindings, pin toes, et cetera. So um, what, what were your thoughts? I thought that was really interesting, man. I, I think it was Lars was saying how 
<clears throat> he would like like a ball and socket instead. And completely, we'd love that. Like we build our recon team boots with just a tech toe because we know the way people ski now is differently. They're using shifts, they're using cast bindings to get up there. It'd be awesome if we could do that. I would do that tomorrow. The problem would be I'd add it onto the boot and it would only work with cast because and then it wouldn't sell because people would have other bindings. So it need, and it's the same you were talking about this with Alpine bindings as well. And I kept thinking to myself, everybody kicked off when we put grip walk soles on because they didn't work with old bindings. So like, it would be awesome to update things so that they work. But unless somehow every piece of gear suddenly burst into flames and was eradicated and everybody started again, we can't do it without people complaining. So. It's a two-way sword. We'd love to innovate, but then people will tell us, oh, it doesn't work with the old gear that you've sold for years. So hmm. it's a double-edged sword, really. Like, it's so hard. Like, we'd love to do it, but you'll complain. Is that the answer, or does, does anybody have anything to add to that? I think from our side, well, the, most of the boots in the industry that have a tech insert are being purchased from DinaFit. So mm -hmm. that compatibility side on our side for tech inserts is over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so like, if a boot has a DinaFit certified insert, it's not just like a piece of metal that we ship to someone else's factory and say, hey, good luck with that, you know, like people like it, you know? it's It comes with the experience of how do you make this thing work in your molds? How do you reach the tolerances? How can everything work and be reliable? And then how can we communicate outwardly to not just DinaFit bindings, but other bindings of like, hey, like this is a standard, try and ask questions about it, you know? Orange sticker on your boot so that you ask a question, hey, like, will this work with my binding? I see the sticker, you know? Like conversation is huge, education is huge, you know? I think to the point of, yeah, I mean, I mean that was a really interesting conversation the other day about bindings and tolerances, I mean, Tolerances are important in all of our lives and everything, like taking care of your gear, asking questions. If you hop into something really high end, like, you know, I guess I'll use a mountain bike analogy again. Like if you're going to buy a really sweet new mountain bike, you're going to learn all the componentry of it. You know, like you're going to ask the questions of how do I make myself safe while using this? What are the limitations of this thing? You know, and I think the ski industry just didn't have this huge disruption for a long time. So people didn't ask questions. They just assumed every boot and every binding and every ski would work yeah. like perfectly. Yeah. But now the consumer is wanting to do more things. They want to go on longer walks than they've ever been on. They want to ski at the resort harder than they've ever yeah. skied on. And so you can't expect like everything just is perfectly the same as it was. I feel like I disagree with like the conversation the other day a little bit more because I feel like the industry is working to make tolerances pretty darn good, you know? Um, but there's this huge education component, you know, of like what, there, there's just a lot of categories, a lot of asks, a lot of different pieces now. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Ricardo, any thoughts on tolerances and compatibility with pin toes and tech bindings, or is there a stance at Dalbello on these things? Uh, luckily, in Dalbello, uh, as you know, we are part of, of a group yeah. and we have Marker. And thankfully, Marker is one of the leader in the, in the bindings. And let's say that they solve our issues. I mean, when we are making new products and we're using Pintex, we are sending it to them and they are testing with all their bindings and all the bindings of the competitors and are giving us the report on what was working or what was not working. Thanks to them, we are usually okay with every bindings, but th this is because they are working with us. It is because Marker is working yeah, with you, yeah, but I mean, yeah. you said usually you're okay with the other. <laughs> that seems a bit- when some, For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, four years ago, first molding uh, of, uh, of the Quantum, uh, we, we shipped them the first one in Pittsburgh. They tested it and we discovered that we were one millimeter higher on the on the plastic on the toe. So substantially, when going full forward, the toe was touching uh, the binding and it was opening it. So immediately we just we lowered of one millimeter the toe of the ski boot and it was fine. Hmm. That that's what that's what I mean with usually. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks to them, we can correct this this. Yeah. 
discrete little problems. So the question is, is there a conversation going on among the brands collectively to get to sort of dial in the uniformity uh, when it comes to grip walk? Yes. There is, the physical, there is a physical mission in which all brand participates. I'm not part of it, so I can't give you any information about it, but there is a physical mission and they are agreed all, with all the brands on the norm. And the, the new norm is ISO 23223. It has been introduced two years ago, if I'm not wrong, or one year ago. One, one and a half years. Uh, one and a half year ago. And yes, there is collaboration on this, absolutely. And how much do you all like what this new certification, are, are you like, this is bullseye or it is just definitely an improvement? I mean, for anybody that's never read an ISO norm before, <laughs> they're incredibly detailed. And I mean, the ISO 23223, which is the new ISO normative that um, replaces basically grip walk mm -hmm. or is grip walk. They took the standard from the grip walk soul and made it an ISO normative. It is super duper detailed with tolerances and exact durometers and everything you wouldn't even think to test. Um, this is definitely like nitty gritty R&D work that um, is a checklist. We have tooling made that's uh, it's a process. For me, the fact that it's been normed under this ISO norm is good news for the industry. It means everything is under one norm. Previously, everything was being sent to Pensbag, to Marker, to actually check to say, can we accept this as a grip walk sole and does it feed, match the, the Marker standard? So I think in that sense, it's going. Uh, the FASI working group is definitely a place where the discussion happens um, on a very technical level, as I understand. Um, but I think the there's no, I, I'm not, I'm not aware. It's an interesting point that you bring up because I have never measured where the, where the point is across different brands. That's something only you would say. Hmm. I guess I would add, like, this is our first boot with a grip box sole to it. Um, you know, when we wrote the brief and we first started working on it, we weren't sure where we, what we were going to do. You know, we were like, is it walk dry? Is it nine, five, two, three? Do you know, do we do a rubber sole? Can we, you know, what's the norm going to do? We didn't know at that point when we started the tie guard boot development, which is our first boot that we need, you know, in terms of like satisfying what was asked of us of this. I just hit the table. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. You were right um, on that. So, but you know, so it was a big learning for us where we had to like really look at it. And it's, I mean, I wouldn't say it was like betting on the right horse, but we were like pretty sure, okay, I think grip walk has it to make it to the standard, you know? And, and so that's why we made that investment there. So not so dissimilar, you know, when we give another brand our inserts where we say, hey, like this is the normative rules that we've created around inserts and placements and how to like control it. We got the same thing reversed for walk to ride or grip walk, sorry. So like, you, like, you know, you look at all of them and, and you follow that place. Is it restrictive in some ways? Sure, because we can't use quick step inserts in our boots with this and i can tell you like from de like developing a boot with a quick step insert stepping in and, and being at a demo like stepping into inserts is not the easiest thing right so we developed this really cool quick step it makes it easier but we can't put a quick step insert and follow the grip walk normative you know and so there's like okay well we could build a better product maybe for you know stepping in but we might not perfectly hit the way the rules are norm so so when I said, I think like the industry at large is doing a good job to improve on norms, like that's a big step, you know, everyone being on board to measure this stuff out, communicate back and forth for that to solve that problem. Absolutely. Because in the beginning of the influx of touring boots with inserts and tech bindings and all that, you know, you'd see, hey, like this didn't work correctly in this scenario. And the first thing you'd blame would be the binding, but then, you know, we would look at it and say, I'm already in now, so I can touch the table all I want. But um, so like, yeah, like, hey, was the boot within the norms of, you know, what we expected at the beginning too. So I think it's, it's a, there's progress being made and I think it will get better. So the question is, we actually only talk about the last or width of a ski boot at the 
forefoot. We never talk about the width of a heel pocket, which is arguably way more important to get a dialed in heel pocket because you can punch out a forefoot of a boot. Why is this? I think there's a few elements. It's not just heel, it's ankle. There's a few things to it instead will make a big difference as well. And I guess just like, to say that's how we've always done it is a bad answer, but yeah. it is how we've always done it. And it probably does make us, I'll come back to Boa, but Boa, a big thing now is getting the heel right is so important because the forefoot does have some adjustability to it. So I'm very much of the opinion that you get the heel, well, with any boot, you get the heel right first, you can make the forefoot work. Yeah. But restarting it and saying, oh, this is, I don't know how many millimeters off the top of my head it would be, but whatever it is, it's just another number to know. And I would hope a lot of people will go to a boot fitter and they'll just work to find a heel pocket that will work. I don't think putting a number on it would help many people, especially a consumer who doesn't understand a hundred millimeter anyway. There's no way they're going to understand the heel measurement. So it would be nice, but I don't think unfortunately long-term it would help a great deal. But in terms of tips for people that are just trying to get a ski boot that works for them, I mean, one of the things I think we can say right now is focus on that heel pocket. Totally. Think about the heel. Mm -hmm. And if, if the heel feels really good and snug and the forefront feels too snug, well, actually, you should probably buy that boot. But if it's still too snug at the forefoot, you can punch that part out. Mm -hmm. And that is not information that maybe a whole lot of skiers are thinking about right now. So that would be a very useful thing to start drilling in a bit, maybe like right now. We all in agreement with that? Absolutely. I think awesome. heel hold and heel pocket is, is critical. Not Hoji. You disagree? No, I mean, I agree 100%, but I think <clears throat> depending where you're at on the world, like boot punching is, this is something that doesn't even exist. You know, like this is a very, not prosumer, but it's it's not something that's always available or people, I mean, even moldable liners is hard for people mm -hmm. to understand or deal with. So, um, yeah, I agree. Like the, the heel area of the boot and the cockpit around your ankle and that kind of security, like I, I would have boots with no toes covering them. That that would be perfect for me. I, I don't need my toes to be crammed in like anymore. Like Flintstones? Yeah, yeah, like, Flintstone yeah. boots. Like that would be the, my dream actually. Because yeah. uh, I don't need that. But yeah, the the last sweat thing, I just laugh about it constantly. Everyone's always asking me like, I don't know. Just look at it. What do you think? Like, I, I won't remember these numbers because they mean nothing to me because it's a measurement arbitrarily somewhere in the front of the boot and the, like it could be anything like I just look but I'm you that's like what I've been focused on is looking at the boot and trying to understand what shape it is uh, but it gets very confusing uh, very quickly and if you started adding more numbers like we already have like the flex index which I call like you pretty much it's like comparable to like how much do you love me a 130. A lot. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. You know, just like it means nothing actually. There's no empirical evidence to this. It's just a number of someone made up one day and like we're all talking about it somehow. And like that's great. But you just put it on and feel it and try it and then you get your own impression. And uh, I mean, the numbers I think, are meaningless. I mean, me. I think generally the idea here <laughs> was that like, <laughs> Let's. We're not like completely like. Are you the corporate guy? <laughs> yeah, okay. cor corporate's gonna yeah. you know lean in here because he's already <laughs> buying a round of beers apparently. Uh, so no, so generally they were categories made before my time, you know, of like a one thirty flex and one fifty, one ten, one twenty, you know, whatever. Those are generalizations that are now kind of held to because, I mean, like I have a background in water kayaking. It'd be really cool if we used volume, you know, like. But then where's the volume? You know, it's just going to open up more questions, right? Because you could have just monster heel pockets or whatever. So the num the answer is, is like figure out like what is the range? You know, what is general range of boots? It's like 98 to 103, right? So then those numbers kind of represent where they fit in the range generally, just like the flex index. 
and then you can kind of work your way in between. But you should always try on a couple boots. So the question is, why are there no women on this panel? And That's do cute. and do we need <laughs> and do we need women specific boots? So one thing is, I don't actually know of a female boot product manager in the world. We have an engineer. Engineer. So that's, that's part of the answer. Um, second part of the question, do we need women-specific boots? Depends what you're calling a women-specific boot. We obviously all make women's boots with short cuffs, lower liners. We are looking right now to see if there's a need to do a women's last compared to our men's last. So like I say, we've just got a female engineer. She's a 23.5, so she can't obviously wear our sample size. So we are moving forward with development in a 27 and a 23 so she can be involved with this. Now, when we come into this, there's a lot of factors to it. Obviously, lots of super expensive molds are as well. So traditionally, we grade them down and we're going to use the same one. We're now looking to see if there's a need to have the women's one. And when we went into this, it, uh, just thinking what I can say here, but there's a project in the works where we are doing this. And we started off going, yeah, we're definitely going to have a women's last. And then we did some work and we're like, you know, what? I'm not sure we need it. We're still open to it, but a women's specific last is awesome, but it's actually not that different than the men's we found. Um, not to say we won't go that route in the long run, but a last is a last. If it fits well, women's feet aren't that much different than men's in the actual foot. There's a lot of data out there. There's grading differences, which is interesting, but the overall shape, it isn't crazy different. So men's last or women's last is not as big a difference as you may think we found. Um, I agree. I think we've done. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's like a study done by a guy who I can't properly reference and, you know, far smarter than me about just like the curve of analysis done and like starting from, you know, a point of more center and then building out versus, you know, on any one end and how you can get to a better result for the, the greatest majority. Um, the, it, like that's an answer. It's not like a great one, right? I mean, we have a ton of women on our team that, that do develop our products. Our product manager for bindings is a female, you know, it's like we're not absent of that talent within our team. But it, yeah, it's a, it's a big one. And I mean, like we're huge advocates to build smaller boots. We're fighting for it pretty regularly. That, that's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's the main thing about yeah. that is like, mm -hmm. that's part of it is like we need yeah. to arrive at some much smaller sizes yep. to to satisfy this not for all women yeah. of course but like the the size range is not reaching far enough down to mm -hmm. satisfy uh, look around talk to mm -hmm. a lot of amazing women around even totally. though, like here at the event and it's like they they would they would probably be happier with a bit more selection in smaller sizes yeah. that, that's i think the point uh, I've seen, and that's not for every woman, but that's like where where the woman's category is suffering the most from what I've seen, actually. And just on that point, be vocal. Mm -hmm. Like we will make the smaller boots, but if a retailer isn't going to buy them, we can't justify it. So we need people to be vocal and saying, I want you guys to have a 21 boot. The reta retailers need to understand there's a demand there. Mm -hmm. If the retailer doesn't buy a 21, we can't make it because it, it doesn't make financial sense. So be vocal. If you guys want stuff, be vocal. And by be vocal, you mean go into shops. Yep. It's like be vocal in the right places. Exactly. It doesn't help saying it to us because we listen, we want to do it. But if a retailer doesn't buy it, it doesn't get to you guys in the end. So what I think I heard you say is that as we like to do here at the summit, predict a little bit into the future, perhaps, you know, two, three, five years out, we might be in a world where we're seeing more unisex ski boots across a broader range of sizes. No. One person nodded, no. Okay. I hope so. Okay. I'd love to be able to answer that question better, you know, because there is a group commercially, it, it's not. Like, you know, like it's tough. It's a really hard problem to solve. Yeah. 
unisex doesn't make sense. Yeah. I think the unisex women's selection difference isn't as critical. I think it's that the boots that we choose to make in the women's sizes fit and work better for those those women. And I think what Tom was saying about choosing a different size to start with in the development makes a huge difference and is something that we're focusing on for future projects as well as not starting with the standard white male size and getting that one perfect and grading it and stretching it as needed, but saying, let's start the first one for 23, 24 and let them get perfected the way it needs to be before we digitally scale it. And I think that'll means more better fitting boots for women coming. This is something, for example, we have done on the race workup line, DRS, for example, uh, the smaller sizes, 22, 23, 24, were developed following the feedback of female athletes, while 25, 26, 27, mainly following the feedback of male athletes. So yes, there are the develop, but at the end of development is not that different. It's not that it's different, but it's not too different world. Okay. We're going to leave it there. Um, once again, uh, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, thanks for a little bit of tipping of the hand of where we might be headed in this whole ski boot world. And um, perhaps most importantly, uh, you know, given that yesterday was Valentine's Day, um, go tell all of your loved ones that you love them a 130. I think that was a big takeaway from the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. From the panel. So thanks to so all I of you. I think 150. Yeah, 150? Yeah, it would be okay, better. I'm going sure. 200. <laughs> 200? Okay. Um, thank you, really, to all of you. And um, between the binding panel, between this panel, I think you all have, I think, appropriately problematized ski boots. And I think the nice thing about that is these things are more complicated than a lot of us might sometimes think. And it is actually kind of reassuring to hear that smart, thoughtful people are working on these things. And so I'll just say for all of us skiers out here, thank you. Uh, keep it up, you know, do better, keep it up, all those things. And we love you 130. Uh, thanks everyone. Um.